to EGM 702, Week 5, Part 2, Image Segmentation and Object-Based Image Analysis. One of the tasks that we are often interested in in image processing and also in remote sensing is identifying objects or features in an image. So you see here this example from scikit-image.org which shows a collection of coins on a black background and we might be interested in identifying or pulling out information about each of the different coins that we see in the image. So this process of pulling out or identifying each of these coins is known as segmenting the image. We can use this processing to create either a mask where we have identified you know, the difference between coin and the background, or we can also use this to create a labeled image, such as is shown here, where each of the individual coins has been identified and given a label, which we can use for further processing. Image segmentation helps us to group similar pictures, pixels together. We can use, for example, similar colors, similar locations within the image, or even using things like the edges of different objects. We've seen some segmentation techniques already. For example, we've worked a little bit with thresholding in the different practicals. You've seen something called Otsu's method, which uses the histogram distribution of an image to help partition it into dark and light pixels. And you can see what that looks like for our coin example here. So if we're using a threshold value of 100, we say that everything that a, every pixel that is above 100 belongs to the bright class, every pixel value below 100 belongs to the dark class. And what we can see here is that with this particular threshold value, we do a decent job of picking out the individual coins, but we also identify quite a bit of the background of the image. If we pick a higher threshold, such as 150, um, we see that we're getting less of the coins, but we are at least separating them effectively from the background. So this is, again, these are methods where we're using the, hist the histogram of the image in order to help find groups of pixels that we can identify. The problem is, is that there can be substantial variation across an image. As you can see here, the background is a bit lighter here than it is in other parts of the image. And so we might want to use sort of an adaptive or a local technique um, where we calculate a threshold based on a local window uh, in order to, uh, to do this kind of segmentation. We can also use techniques called clustering, where we uh, let the computer uh, use a number of different algorithms to help identify clusters of pixels that we can uh, then start to work with. Uh, for example, we've seen k-means clustering as one example, non-iterative clustering as another example that we'll look at in the practical for this week. We can also use things like edge detection, where we find the edges of objects and then we use that to help identify or segment the image based on these boundaries that we see. And we can also use something called a watershed transformation. And this is where we use the brightness values in the image as if they were an elevation. And we can use techniques used in hydrology to help break up the different parts of the image into different watersheds or different features uh, that we can then use in further analysis. So this process of segmentation leaves us with something called an object in an image or an image object. These roughly correspond, in, at least in remote sensing, to real world objects. And you see two different examples of a segmentation on an aerial photograph here, and you can see that we have image boundaries that are separating, for example, the land and the water here. You see different patches of water that have been identified based on some properties of the pixel values. You see also we have the house or the buildings here with the different roof colors based on whether they're directly or indirectly illuminated. Um, so we see that there's a lot of structure in the image that has come out of this segmentation process. Um, we also will often 
uh, especially with remote sensing images, segment hierarchically. So we start at very low resolution images and then we start to segment at finer and finer resolutions or at different scales that we can then use. This technique of segmenting an image and then using the image, I, the, the objects identified during the segmentation process is part of something called object-based image analysis or OBIA. And this is a classification technique where we are classifying image objects. So the different objects that are identified as part of the segmentation process rather than the individual pixels. So this gives us the advantage of, for example, having our classification boundaries more identified by the larger scale structure of the image rather than sometimes the random noise that you can see at the pixel level, at the individual pixel scale. If you've looked at um, the results of image classification, you can also often see, um, or you hopefully saw in EGM 713, this sort of salt and pepper pattern where you have random misclassified pixels in a larger uh, patch of a certain classification. Um, this sort of thing doesn't tend to happen with object-based image analysis because we are uh, starting off by identifying objects and then applying a classification to them. When we're doing this sort of classification, we can use things like the pixel values or the statistics of the pixel values that make up each of our individual image objects. But we can also use different things like the texture, so the uh, variation in brightness that takes place within a given image object. We can also use things like the object properties, so for example the shape or the size to help classify it. And we can also use relationships to other classes in order to help us identify and classify the objects in the image. One problem that we often have is that we have imperfectly defined boundaries between the different classes that we're trying to identify. This can be because pixels are often mixed. For example, we have th what that means rather is that we have more than one object or more than one surface present within a given pixel. Uh, this can be especially true as we get to the lower resolution images. It's a little bit less of a problem with high resolution images. Um, but we also, uh, sometimes we just, you know, there can be differences in illumination during, in parts of scenes. Shadows can be a problem um, where we, you know, have a range of pixel values that uh, can be belonging to two different classes. Uh, this example here showing uh, that we have water forested wetland and upland forest that we're attempting to identify. And you can see that there's, you know, trees that are sort of present within what we would traditionally consider the range of water values. Similarly, we have some water within the forested wetland class and so on. So we have these sort of overlapping boundaries between our different classes, um, which can lead to misclassification, which we would like to try to minimize. One solution that we have is that we can use a membership function to relate the pixels or the objects that we're classifying two different classes. So for example, rather than this hard, fast boundary between different classes here, uh, in a fuzzy classification, um, which is coming from something called fuzzy logic or fuzzy set theory, which accepts that, you know, these, which rather works with the idea that these hard, fast boundaries don't actually exist, so we have sort of more shades of gray uh, in the world. Um, so we have, rather than, again, rather than these hard, fast boundaries, we have these membership functions which say, okay, in this example here, um, starting at a uh, near-infrared brightness value of 24, ramping up to a value of 36, we have this line that identifies the percent membership or the probability uh, membership that a given pixel belongs to either the water class or the forested wetland class. So we're starting with a probability of one that it belongs to water at, um, at a value of 24. 
decreasing down to zero at 36. And for the forested wetland, we are starting at zero at a value of 24, going all the way up to a value of 36 at, or a value of one at a near infrared brightness value of 36. And so what this does is that rather than saying, okay, this pixel or this object is definitely water or definitely forested wetland, it might say that, okay, for a given pixel value, this particular, um, this particular pixel for, for a given brightness value, this partic particular pixel might have a 70% membership in water and a 30% membership in forested wetlands. So we can use this information to help improve our classification um, or to create multiple different possible classification maps that we can use to, uh, to work with. Object-based image analysis has seen a number of, uh, or an increased number of applications over the past decade or so um, as it's developed. Uh, it's particularly well suited for high resolution images. Uh, one example that I'll show here is from some work that I did in a past life where I pretended to be a seal biologist. Uh, and this is where I was doing uh, an object-based image analysis of air photos. So we have photos like this that are taken uh, as part of surveys looking for harbor seals in, a, in an inlet in Glacier Bay, Alaska. And you can see on this iceberg in particular, there's a couple of seals that are hanging out. And so the idea is, is that we use these images to help us count the seals and estimate the population. But you can also see that there's a lot of information in here about, for example, how much ice is covering the fjord uh, when they do the surveys. And as these particular seals are uh, using this ice as habitat, either for resting or for molting and raising their pups, we're particularly interested in looking at the evolution of the ice cover over time. So we use an object-based image analysis to segment these images, identify the large icebergs that seals might be able to use for habitat, uh, as well as the smaller amounts of ice, which can still provide some, some information, uh, or we, which might be still somehow related to seal populations as well as the amount of open water that we see in a given image. So this example here shows one result uh, for this particular image. You can see there's a number of seals scattered throughout the image, and there's a number of large ice blocks or icebergs that the seals are using um, for, their, um, for resting, for, for hauling out of the water. And if we look at this spread over the entire uh, fjord system here, this, the Johns Hopkins Inlet in Glacier Bay, Alaska, we can see that the seal population tends to hang out in areas where we also have large percentages of icebergs. So that's something that's uh, actually still ongoing with the different uh, seal biologists that are involved. But this, um, this application of object-based image analysis uh, helped us to actually map the habitat for these um, for these seals. There's also another example that I've uploaded to Blackboard um, showing how this can be used to do things like mangrove mapping, which is particularly difficult at a pixel level because mangroves uh, and particularly mangrove trees can look very similar to other land cover types. And so it's difficult to pull out that, um, it's, it's difficult to identify them in images if we uh, are only using the uh, pixel reflectance values. So this study uh, that I've uploaded is using worldview images which have a pixel resolution of about 20 centimeters or so. So to sum all of this up, um, our brains tend to work by separating an image into objects. When we are doing image segmentation, well, we're having a computer do the same thing for us. We're dividing an image up into different objects that we can then work with. Um, Object-based image classification or image analysis helps us to classify image objects rather than pixels, which allows for more information to be used in the classification process, as well as typically more accurate results because we get rid of some of the random noise that exists in the classification. 
There are a number of applications for object-based image analysis in geography and remote sensing. And I will, uh, the next slide will show uh, a list of different papers that I've uploaded to Blackboard uh, that you can have a look at. So uh, you could read more about all of these topics in a uh, textbook in Jensen, Chapter 9. Um, there's also a, I think, freely available through the Ulster Library uh, book on object-based image analysis by Blaschke, Lang, and Hay uh, that came out in 2008. Um, I'll provide a, a citation for this on Blackboard and you can go have a look for that yourself. Uh, I've also included a link to a couple of uh, classic papers on image segmentation, as well as some classic papers on object-based image analysis, as well as some applications, um, as you can see here. So that's all I have for this lesson. I hope you found it interesting. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to post them on the discussion forum on Blackboard. Thanks. Bye.